full four copies, just guy ascendancy, and cards like anticipates and disdainful strokes in the main deck. Definitely taking a more controlling approach on the on the archetype. And I think that as like you're seeing both players here with some main deck inclusions to try to fight Esper Dragons. In James Gurner's list, you're seeing three main deck copies of Disdainful Stroke. And in Josh Bauer's teamer deck, three main deck copies of Teamer Charm alongside the three copies of Summer Denial. Three mana for Mana Leak is not a horrible deal against Esper Dragons when they're trying to tap out for powerful five, six, seven mana plays. Yeah, so Josh is going to be on a six card hand for this game. Now, both these players have two losses and a draw. So both still live for top eight with two wins should get them in. It's possible that the loser of this game match can still top eight, but he'll definitely need things to break his way. Yeah, we'll need a lot of luck to make the top eight, but the winner should be in great shape. Both players trading lands to be in the game. It's a mountain for Josh and a battlefield forge for, forge for James. Yeah, my coast will lead into Air of the Wilds for Josh. And Josh making it very clear what his deck is up to with the teamer mana available and a ferocious creature in play. Yeah, Air of the Wild is one of those, it's been an interesting card in the deck. Um, it is one, probably one of the best two drops for Teamer and maybe one of the weaker parts of the Teamer archetype in that it is not a particularly powerful card, but kind of a necessity for the Teamer deck. It helps a lot against the Obzon aggro kind of matchups. And you just need to start casting stuff earlier in the game, take advantage of your other beaters. He attacks with Air of the Wilds. James attempts to raise an alarm to block it, but Teamer Charm will mana leak that spell, so it'll be countered. Air will swing in for two. Both players taking some incidental damage off their lands here, by the way. You see both of James's lands are pain lands. The Yava Mayakos has been tapped for green twice as well on Josh's side. The much maligned Teamer Charm doing what it does. They traded. Now, if he's going to make that play, it is, yeah, it, no, it's the same both ways. Yeah, it doesn't actually get a. a yep, he can let works. he can let it block and then fight, but th this way he gets the two points of damage across by just counting yeah. it out right. Jeskai Ascendancy is a turn three play for James Gurner, so he does have that on turn three. But of note, he has three painlands, so he paid three life for Jeskai Ascendancy there, and that could really hurt him as J Josh's play is Savage Knuckleblade Haste Attack for seven. And that's really important for Josh because with James playing Jeskai Ascendancy, he has the long-term advantage big time. Josh needs to close out this game quickly, and Savage Knuckleblade uh, being a haste threat, pumping up Air of the Wilds, uh, trying to close this game out as quickly as possible before Jeskai Ascendancy uh, overwhelms Josh. And how much of the story has just been the lands that James has? These, he's taking too much damage to stabilize. Yeah, four damage so far just off of lands, one from Raise the Alarm and, and three from the Ascendancy. And I don't actually know if he can interact with the board effectively. His hand appears to be cards like Stoke the Flames, Anticipate, the same full stroke. Uh, he may not be able to interact with the board this turn, and he is facing lethal. And he has an Anticipate in hand, so he can Anticipate and loot. Perhaps if he finds a card like Wild Slash, the that doesn't work. Savage Uncle Blade can pump. Exactly. Even if he finds Wild Slash, there's still lethal coming across. I don't know if he has a draw here. He may just be dead on the board. Interesting spot to be this early. And here's a swing. It's for seven from Josh. Yeah, I just don't think there's an out here. I mean, Josh has to cast, James has to cast something. And if he casts something, he's going to take damage, and then Savage Knuckleblade can finish it off. He'll cast Anticipate, go to six. Here's the Jeskai Ascendancy trigger. And, and Josh is not even going to let it have it with a Stubborn Denial there, and that wraps up a very fast first game. So game one in Teamer Midrange, and jo goes over to Josh Bower. The Jeskai tokens can be a little bit clunky, and it's very important to capitalize on the turns they take off to cast Jeskai Ascendancy. Uh, Josh had the perfect play there with Savage Knuckleblade, and James just did not have an opportunity to play the cards in the end. Plenty of powerful stuff going on, but just no time. Win puts Josh a little bit closer to the top eight here in our standard open. If you're looking to play in one of the StarCityGames.com opens, we now have the rest of our events for the year announced. Starting, we are in quarter two, but we now have our quarter three season. That starts with our modern Grand Prix in Charlotte. We've told you about that one we, this weekend, and we'll tell you more about it. But we do make some trips across the Midwest. That's going to be a standard open in Indianapolis in June, going to Bald Standard in Baltimore. And for the first time in mid-July, mid we are going to be headed toward the great city of Chicago. 
as we go through season three. This one's a longer one. We then go back over east. Yeah, we head to Richmond, then a legacy open in Washington, D.C. Then we go even further east for a Santa Grand Prix in London, a modern open series in Charlotte after that, and then after that, the season three invitational in New Jersey. Standard and Legacy has the invitational formats with a two-day $20,000 Standard Open Series event the end of August the 28th through 30th. Yeah, for those of you playing in IQs at home, remember we are alternating our invitationals this year. Some of them will be a mix of Standard and Legacy, where some will be a mix of Standard and Modern. So depending on which of those formats you want to play, you can plan your schedule accordingly. Yep. It will always be half Standard and then half one of the older formats. Yeah. A change. A change I'm a really big fan of. I know, especially for players who've gotten into the game more recently, not all of them own Legacy decks or get the chance to play Legacy that often. So both our Season 2 Invitational, which we're leading up toward now in Columbus, and the one at the end of the year, which will be here in the Northwest, uh, both those will be feature Modern as one of their formats. I'm also just a big fan of showcasing all the constructed formats. I really like that change to 2015, where we now have Modern on camera alongside Legacy and Standard. So uh, the more different formats we can highlight, the fresher the coverage is, and uh, I personally enjoy it a lot. All right, so going to the team mid mid-range deck, we haven't seen this one yet on camera. One of the things that really impresses me about it is how much haste is in the deck. It can be very difficult for Jeskai tokens to deal with. They oftentimes have removal spells, but still take damage while they're killing creatures, whether they're Thunderbreak Regents, Savage Knuckleblades. Knuckleblade is, is really hard for the deck to deal with just by itself. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's Stoke the Flames, and that's a reasonable answer if he has it on time, though that's, that's hard to do without at least taking one shot. But it sneaks underneath the same full stroke. It, it's really hard to block with almost any creature in the deck. The tokens don't do very much to affect it. It's, that's only a temporary solution. So it, it is a problematic card for Jeskai tokens. So we look at the sideboard from James Gurner. We have copies of Anger of the Gods, Dragonlord Ojitai, End Hostilities, Negate, Glare of Heresy, Elspeth Sun's Champion, Disdainful Stroke, and then an interesting one in Ojitai Exemplars. How do those help him fight this matchup? I think that he's going to bring in the uh, Ojitai Exemplars alongside Dragonlord Ojitai and the End Hostilities and just try to convert into a control deck. Uh, you saw if he tries to damage race with Josh, that's not going to be a very good matchup for him most of the time. I think he really wants to settle into a control role here. Yeah, Ojitai Exemplar is a pretty interesting card here. If he can't kill spell the team or creatures, perhaps he can just make something that can block them. And Exemplars is a great card that can do that. Especially if he's has access to other late game effects like Elspeth on champion. He has a copy of it in his sideboard and the Dragon Lord Joseph Tai. So uh, I think James would be well served here by just trying to slow down the deck a little bit, become more of a control deck. All right, over in the sideboard options for Josh Bower. This does seem like a matchup he, he wants to be playing, first of all. Looks really good game one. He's got a Rending Volley, a Shamanic Revelation, a Cure, the Crashing Wave, a Sorok Dragon Claw, a Stubborn Denial, two copies of the same Volstro, two copies of Encase Nice. Two copies of Destructive Revelry, two Feed the Clan, two Anger of the Gods. You can see Anger of the Gods coming in in this matchup. Uh, it, it is a little bit risky if James converts into a control deck, but against the game one build of the deck, at least it looks pretty good. I think the uh, copy, the additional copy of Stubborn Denial is likely to come in this matchup. James, of course, is playing with a bunch of spells. And he has access to Destructive Revelry if he wants to fight over the, the fight over just guys' ascendancy itself. I don't actually expect him to change too much, though. Stubborn Denial seems good as a counter spell. Sorok Dragon Claw is, is a decent threat in the matchup, but th there's not. He's, he's pretty well set up in the main deck for this. Yeah, I feel with Summer Denial and Teamer Charm, he has the ability to keep James off of a lot of his high impact plays. And Josh's curve is just a lot smoother than James, which, who, who was very glutted with expensive cards there in game one and just couldn't deploy his hand in time. We'll see if James can get on the advantage. For game two, he's down a game, but he'll get to be on the play for game two. And one thing, we said Jeskai, that deck that you mentioned at one point in the metagame was the deck to beat, really has fallen off here. Only three copies of Jeskai making it into day two out of 109. So really has fallen off that tier one perch. And a lot of times when I watch it play, you see games like this where, to be honest, the deck just seems slow. Yeah, you know, the problem with the deck, in my opinion, is there's just a lot going on at three mana. That's why you see in some of the decks include cards like Dragon Fodder, even though it is, uh, on the surface, seemingly a lot worse than Raise the Alarm. It's just to lower the curve of the deck. And Anticipate kind of helps towards that end, but it also doesn't really, because it's not impacting the board. Yeah. It's just something to do on the second turn. Anticipate's a great card in the deck, but if the criticism is that the deck is slow, Anticipate's not a very fast magic card. Yeah. So, a lot of concern there. You don't see those games where you just go off with Jeskai Ascendancy nearly as often. A lot of people can blow up your enchantment or, or simply kill you before you get it going. You saw James had Jeskai Ascendancy there, but no time to win the game. A lot more copies of Bio Blight floating around the metagame than maybe there was a, a month or so ago. 
and Dromoka's command is a huge problem for this deck. Uh, in, in fact, James has gotten away mostly from creatures, and I, I would imagine part of the response to that is you increase your vulnerability to Dromoka's command even greater when you're playing threats like Goblin Rabble Master alongside Jeskai Ascendancy. The card just do, does too much, so James is basically just on an all-token strategy, uh, in, in some part to blunt the impact of that card, I'm sure. Yeah, Josh going down to six. He was on six last game, but that hardly mattered. He was able to kill James before James was able to cast the cards in his hand. Yep. I mean, James had a, a clunky draw there, though not, not an abnormally clunky draw. He had Raise the Alarm on turn two and Ascendancy on turn three. Yeah. A lot of pain lands were in the mix and uh, just didn't have an opportunity to be able to cast the Treasure Cruises or even the Stoke the Flame that was in his hand. There are just a lot of moving pieces here. If you're paying four mana for Stoke the Flames. It looks a lot less impressive. You see that the decks that are playing Stoke the Flames really have just gotten more and more aggressive. It's the best way to capitalize on that card. And Josh keeping on six. So we are into game two. James starting to play this time on a temple. He's not going to be on all pain lands this game. Scries to the bottom. He does have a Hordling Outburst to build his way up to. Both players play trade temples. James, I'm not sure his mana is exactly where he wants it to be. Gonna have a turn two Seeker of the Way, but double Treasure Cruise in hand, Hordling Outburst. I, I do not believe he has blue mana. Yeah, I don't or think a third land. Or a third land. Radical Mystic is a play for Josh, and one thing the Teamer deck does well is it's pretty consistent here. He'll start making threats as early as this next turn. James offers a offers Seeker for Radical Mystic, but way too many instants for Josh to accept that trade. Well, for, most of the instants that James can have in that spot are just direct damage spells that could kill the Radical Mystic anyway. Yeah, I, raise the alarm would be the one he really wouldn't yeah, want to see. Yeah, raise the alarm, and, and I think Josh just values his Radical Mystic very highly. I mean, he wants to get out in front of James before James can really capitalize uh, with his more expensive, more powerful spells. So it looks like John James did hit the land he wanted that turn. It was Mystic Monastery, so it'll come into play tapped, but it'll fix all his colors. Swings for two and passes. He does have one card he can play this turn. That's a copy of Valorous Stance in his hand. And if Josh plays a large creature here, James will get to use that mana and stay on pace. We'll see. Josh tap fetching, and he'll go for Thunderbreak Regent. And this curve works out very nicely for James, who has the ability to Valorous Stance this Thunderbreak Regent now. Untap and play Hordling Outburst. Hit for three, really develop his board. Yeah, James takes three, but that's not much of a concern here. So Thunderbreak hits the graveyard. For James, he draws land number four. It's going to be a basic island, but then goes ahead and plays Hordling Outburst, gets three goblins, Prowess is the Seeker of the Way, so that'll become a 3-3 three, three lifelink. Hit Josh down to 14 and Jay heal James all the way back up to 20. Just a great set of turns there from James, breaking serve with the Valorous Stance and then really applying some pressure this turn. Yeah, it was really important to think that Josh played a card there that could trade with Valorous Stance. Yeah, if Josh, if Josh makes James burn off the two mana there, then uh, James' opening there is a lot less yeah. impressive. Something like Yasova Dragon Claw would have been difficult, more difficult for James. Yeah. Frontier Bivouac for Josh. It's his own try line, so it comes into play tapped. He's at 14, now on the back foot. And when Jeskai Tokens gets out in front, it can be pretty threatening. A lot of its cards get a lot, get really increase in power level. Now, I don't know if... James really has a follow-up left in his hand. I think it's just a couple copies of Treasure Cruise. Well, Stoke will up. So Josh's turn was Knuckle Blade, Haste, Attack. Those three goblins plus the island meant that James could stoke the flames down the Knuckle Blade. So Josh cost him his whole turn and his tapped creature. Fortunately for Josh, no follow-up here from James. Drew Landa came into play tap, so he can't cast Treasure Cruise this turn. And most likely next turn has to spend his entire turn to cast if he wants to do that. So Josh may have a couple turns here to try to recover. Down to nine, though. That swing was for five, three goblins, and a Seeker. How can Josh recover? He does have an opening, as you mentioned. James isn't going to be doing much. He's not going to be putting much on the board in these, in these next couple turns. Josh will play a morph, pass the turn. That's a win for the Jeskai player. Of all the things he could have done, that seems less threatening. You know, Storm Breath Dragon could have happened. I mean, um, even if it's a potent morph, it's still not even very good for Josh. Yeah, and I believe it's just a Rattleclaw Mystic. Yeah. Oh, here's going to be the treasure cruise. James is reloading. Is it going to work? And it will. Seeker of the Way Prowess up to a 3-3. Three, three. Yeah, there could have been a lot of bad things there. Stubborn Denial would have been really rough. Uh, a Stratus Dancer down there would have been really bad. But uh, James had nothing else to do that turn, so he's got he's just got to kind of risk it. The card's drawn. Another Seeker of the Way, a Fetchland, and Secure the Wastes. 
pretty fine three for James. He'll now get to keep making land drops and build up toward that large secure. And the team will come in again. He's willing to trade away a goblin just for some damage. So Seeker's a 3-3. Three, three. Accompanied by three goblins with Josh at nine. I really like this attack. Yeah, this looks like a really nice attack. This is also a type that's somewhat risky if the morph down there is Den Protector because Josh gets a trade and gets to get something back. But James is just trying to finish off the game at this point. Yeah, and as we know, there are no Den Protectors or Death Mist Raptors in this teamer deck. It's just Rattleclaw Mystic. And Josh blocks, takes five, goes on to four. And... He'll flip Rattleclaw Mystic, making mana. So he does get to ramp this turn, and it will be Sarkon Unbroken. The new Planeswalker from Dragons of Tarkir. A powerful card in his deck, but he's fairly far behind. And at four, he is definitely not safe. Jeskai plays cards like Stoke the Flames. I mean, if he's going to stabilize, it's going to be through the Planeswalker. It's got to be like this. Yeah, he doesn't have life gain on his side. If James's hand is clunky, there's a chance that he can't tender much of an attack this turn, and, and Josh gets an opportunity to pull it back around. But it's asking a lot. James has looked at a lot of cards last turn via Treasure Cruise. And so if you're playing Jeskai and you see phase on Morphs, do you think he might have a Den Protector Death Mist package? Because if you're doing that, cards like Air of the Wilds become so... Like, you've seen Air of the Wilds. Can, can it, you know, does that mean you don't think he, he plays those? I think it's unlikely, but you can never completely rule it out. And with Josh tapped down, James gets a real good opportunity here to just resolve Elspeth's son's champion. I think that's what he's going to go for. Yep. Uh, I mean, both plussing and minusing this turn are pretty powerful. Uh, I think my preference is slightly towards the side of minusing as you get to unleash a pretty big attack here and put Josh close to the ropes. And he needs to get, if he gets that blocker off the battlefield, then he's going to force Josh into some bad plays. So Here's Sun's champion. If, if James goes ahead and plays Elspeth and pluses, then he can't even really attack this turn. I suppose he can still attack. It's just a lot worse. We'll see which one James Gurner goes for. It's going to be minus three. Destroy all creatures with power four or greater. That will be the dragon token, so it's gone. Seek of the Way Prowess is into a 3-3. Three, three. He has that 3-3 three, three and two 1-1 one, one tokens. All of Josh's blocks will cost him creatures. Now James attacks. We can see if they're going at James or at Sarkon. I like this. He looks like James is going to leave back one goblin to protect Elspeth. And he's swinging enough to still make it lethal. I think Josh just has to fall to one here and try to go into next turn with Sarkon. Unless he has some big trump, and then he can just double trump block and, and do whatever he's going to do. But he needs to be able to threaten Elspeth next turn. One Rattleclaw jumps in front of Seeker of the way. The other Goblin hits him. Josh goes down to three. James gains three more life. That will be the turn. Does mean that Josh, if he wants to get rid of his Planeswalker, can have another Dragon. He may have to. But can he survive? It's pretty close here. Josh's list also plays with one main deck copy of Dragonlord of Tarka. That would be very impressive if he get to this turn somehow. And he'll plus Sarkon. Ne hand is not good enough, so he's going to need another card. Draw a card and make a mana. Mm -hmm. Has to name the color when he activates it. After right, right when he draws the card, though. You draw a card, then add. Right. So, so you, you, draw get to card. See, you get to see what you get first, and then add a mana as appropriate. Card be a lot more difficult if it was the other order. Yeah, you typically want to design cards in such a way that when people have to make a decision, they have all the information that's pertinent. You don't want to order it the other way. Makes a green mana, draws a card. Can he stabilize here? He's at three. This is... He doesn't have a way on board of getting Elspeth off the table. He'll go for Surak Dragonclaw. And then it looks like play a tap land. Had to do that now, even though it's in, it has flash and can't be countered because he needed the mana off of Sarkon. 
Now, what I do like about this is if he wants to, he can attack Rattleclaw Elspeth and kill it. Surak does give Elspeth, give the dra Rattleclaw trample. Yep. It looks like Josh is just hanging back on defense. Yeah, I don't know. I, I think I wanted, I know it puts him to one, but there is a, it's close. Yeah. Getting Elspeth off the table is a huge prize. The only reason I think to do this is if Josh has Dragon Lord Tarka, or is it playing to Dragon Lord Tarka, and is planning on taking care of everything next turn and just wants to keep himself alive and give him a shot to do that. Yeah, but because Elspeth's around, three more soldiers are now on the board. Sometimes you forget about that ability on Dragon Claw as well. The, that your two ones have trample. Yeah, it's, but it's particularly kind of your two ones is, yeah. doesn't feel like it's coming up a lot, but. You see quite a lot of action, though, in, Gar in James's hand. Two Seeker of the Ways, Secure the Wastes, Negate, and Treasure Cruise. He has a lot more ways to fight here. And James has to be a little bit worried from what he saw last turn. Why is he main phase, you know, the main phase on Surak implies that he has something to do with the mana. The fact that he didn't attack the Elspeth last turn when he could have gotten off the table implies that he has some other way to answer it next turn. Yeah, Josh's plays, uh, you know, if you're James, it's giving you a lot of pause. Swings well as creatures. That's the Seeker of the Way get eaten by Surak. Goblin Token gets in and puts Josh down to two. But it takes care of Rattleclaw Mystic. And James would negate and secure the waste in hand, I think, is well served by just hanging back on defense. Uh, with Josh at two, the mixture of those cards should make you safe. And have a lot of attackers next turn. It's unlikely Josh will deal with it. Here's Anger of the Gods to try to clean up everything. And to be honest, he's probably okay with that. He can negate it. He can also just let this happen and then secure the wastes. Well, the problem is, what if Josh has a negate of his own? Well, he could, he could just secure for three and leave up two here. Sure. <laughs> Sorak takes care of Elspeth. So yeah, if he secures for three and leaves up negate, I don't, I don't believe there's an out. You see Sarkon making a dragon. And that's exactly what James is going to do. Makes three attackers, only one blocker on Josh means this is lethal. He'll have a negate up. Josh doesn't have two, one, doesn't have two cards. He can play off two mana. So this should be good enough. I like the line a lot here by James. Yeah, this is a, a very safe way of doing it. There's three one ones. One blocker. It's going to be a lethal attack. Untaps. Josh is at two. Here's the swing. And that'll do it. No negate necessary. We are on to game three. Didn't even have to show the negate, though. It's somewhat implied there by James only securing there for a couple instead of the maximum amount, but got to hide that as well. Remember, these players are building toward our Invitational, our Season 2 Invitational. And if you have not seen the Invitationals, there's a lot going on. We had our first one of the season, a showdown between Reed Duke and Jacob Wilson, two of the top players in Magic. Eventually, it was Obzon Control and Jacob Wilson that ended up on top. And because of that, one of the prizes, as well as an, addition to the, an invitation to the Players' Championship, is your own art on a token, and Jacob Wilson's is a good one at that. He chose the Monk token off Monastery Mentor. You see there his art featured on the token. You can now receive these limited edition Invitational tokens tokens they are given to every entry to our 20k open series players everyone in the main event this weekend as well as those entering the 5k premier iqs that we hold on day two or you can find in your area at starcitygames.com if it is hard for you to make it to one of those events also if you place an order from starcitygames.com of at least five dollars you'll receive one of these in the mail along with your magic cards and this is available for a limited time only remember we make one of these every time there's a new invitational winner we're going to have an invitational in about a month in Columbus, Ohio. So if you want your Jacob Wilson Monk token, either sign up for one of our large events or place an order at starcitygames.com today. Yeah, they're traded by SEG's own Kristen Plesko. Definitely, these tokens just, I've, almost all of them are home runs. Not only really that, they're I, great. I'm still blown away that this token got turned around within a week. We did yeah. the invitational in Richmond, and the following week, these were available. I, don't, I have no idea how it got turned around that fast. Well, we are in the game three, though. Teamer and Jeskai facing off here. And actually, it's great. Monastery Mentor has really seen an uptick in play since the creation of that token. We have seen it a lot in Ban Heroic decks. Ross Miriam winning in Cleveland last week at two in the main deck. And the list we've seen, I feel like one or two copies have been floating all around in a lot of main decks. We've seen it in various Jeskai builds. We've seen it as a sideboard plan. We've seen it all over the place. Took a little while. I mean, the, the initial play that the card got did not match the hype. Uh, but recently, we've definitely seen an uptick. 
We did see James take game two there, and it seemed like what was important was he was able to na make it through the early game. We talked about there was a really key turn there where Josh had a four mana play on Thunderbreak Regent, and James was able to Valorous Dance it. It was just that James was able to basically not get too far behind on the board, and then the fact that his cards are very difficult to remove, that Josh doesn't have too much removal, and that James has cards like Treasure Cruise, those are able to carry him out. James has a really potent late game, and he does have a fair amount of removal. It's just about weathering the storm of the initial turns. The edge that Josh has if the game gets later is his counter spells are very powerful. Uh, Teamer Charm can affect some of the bigger plays, and Stubborn Denial is likely to counter uh, a lot of James' stuff if Josh has any sort of board. So. I think that Josh is favored very early on in the game because he can just bring a lot of power to mana onto the table early on. Later on in the game, his saying power is basically with the counter spells. But I think once you start getting to turn five, turn six, turn seven, James just has more flexibility, more card advantage, and should be a favorite, uh, though no guarantee once the game gets to that stage. Well, players doing out here. Josh has been on six cards for the first two games. He'll get to be on the play, though. Important card, I'm looking for Josh. I'm definitely looking for the Elvish Mystic. The ability to get out ahead at the beginning of the game is really important. It is important, though it's worth noting with, with Teamer's mana base the way that it is, Elvish Mystic does not always yield the most explosive draws because turn two Savage Knuckleblade requires very specific lands. Yeah. Even the turn three Thunderbreak region out of this deck requires very specific lands. So the, the Mystic is nice, but does not guarantee Josh suddenly becomes as explosive as, say, the mono green deck that we've had on camera. Sure. Both players trade tri lands to start the game, so their mana taking color requirements taken care of. For Josh, it'll be a turn two Elvish Mystic into what looks to be a temple. So a slower start, building up toward a good turn three play, his mana now pristine. Exactly. Now things like turn three Thunderbreak region, they're online. See what James can keep pace with. For the Jeskai deck, these early turns are just about parrying blows. You know, can he trade Valorous Stance with James's, with Josh's cards? Can he maybe Disdainful Stroke a 4-drop? Can he do something that's that's relevant? He would hate to just not play anything here. Exactly. The Valorous Stance there from James in Game 2 was so critical. At that point, the boy board was clean, and James started to get to deploy his more expensive cards. That's really critical. Here's Savage Knuckle Blade. And Haste. Does he have the stance for it? No, he does not. Swings in, and that's four damage. James down to 16. So important for Josh that that knuckle blade was good there. Uh, yeah. If James has Valorous stance and any sort of hand, the game could already spiral out of control. As it stands, James did nothing on the second turn. I, I believe maybe he's casting Anticipate, but Josh doesn't mind about that so much. And if James wants to untap him, cast Ascendancy next turn, uh, he risks taking just a ton of damage. And we may see a repeat of the first game where James had the tools, but just not the time to deploy it all. And I like the play from Josh. He may have had the option between Knuckleblade and some of his other threats, but while he played one that died to, just to Valor Stance, the Knuckleblade Haste play plays around Disdainful Stroke. So he's doing a great job of trying to make it so that James had no turn two play, and he ended up succeeding. James just didn't do anything here. Valor Stance gets him one way or the other, whether it's Thunderbreak yep. Regent or Savage Knuckleblade, but one of those cards gets tagged by Disdainful Stroke, and the other does not. So it's so good for Josh to be able to play around one of the cards. Now, as it stands, I think James had neither and was just going to anticipate on this turn. But still, Josh is trying to give the most opportunities for James to burn off that second turn. And that's the type of turn that Josh needs to be able to get out in front of James in a big way uh, before James can deploy his big stuff. And James's hand is powerful but slow and may just be not what he needs in the matchup. I believe he kept hand of lands and anticipate and two Jeskai ascendancies. It certainly sets up for a great late game, but it's going to be hard-pressed for him to not die before that happens. Yeah, we may be looking at a repeat of, of Game 1 where James's hand is not lacking power. It's just lacking ways to interact early and often enough. And uh, if his play here is Turn 3 Ascendancy, which it appears to be, uh, Josh has free reign again this turn to make a, a big development. Now, because he has two Ascendancies, James... Is, I think he's going to use these ascendancies to try to convert into just a pure control deck. So he'll take some hits this turn, but starting next turn, he'll be okay doing something like trading Valor Stance simply for an activation of Savage Knuckleblade. The amount of card advantage he can get from two Jeskai ascendancies will allow him to throw away cards for life points if he needs to. He may not have that kind of time, though. I mean, he's already 11, and, and Knuckleblade hits hard. Knuckleblade hit, but no other plays from Josh. He's just going to protect Savage Knuckleblade. So at least, as far as that's concerned, that's somewhat of a win for James. The fact that Josh didn't mash more creatures into this board. Uh, possibly, though, if Josh is sitting on cards like Stubborn Denial and Teamer Charm, uh, it, it's still a, a lot of trouble. Oh, yeah. It's going to be Ojatai Exemplars from James. 
That's an interesting one. Maybe not what you'd expect. But again, this might be too slow now with uh, with Surak filling up to the party. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it turns out Josh did have something to play. It was an end step Surak Dragon Claw. That with Savage Knuckle Blade, that's, that's lethal. These Ojata Exemplars are going to have to chump block. Right. Here's a swing. It's 10 power, and it can pump up to more. Exemplars will go in front of Savage Knuckle Blade. That will force Josh to use his mana. Pumps it. Remember, the Knuckle Blade has Trample, so two Tramples over plus six. James down to three. Sorry, Dragon Claw just doing work. <laughs> now, an interesting question. If Josh has a tap land here, which he does, does James have... He has End Hostilities in his sideboard. If he just fifth land End Hostilities here, he may be able to steal. Exactly. Jo Josh still could potentially have Summer Denial, but it is potentially a way to get back in this game. Anticipate here, though. That's great news for Josh. Gurner will loot, finds a pain land. That's not what he needs. He'll go ahead and discard that. And normally, in, in spots like this, Jeskai Tokens is looking at things like Raise the Alarm and Hordling Outburst to try to block and, and get an opportunity for it next turn. But with Sorok Dragon Claw in, in play, Granny Trample, that's not an option for James. That not being an option? I'm not sure he has anything he can do. And he does not. Josh Bower, two games to one. Moves on with Teamer Midrange. Great to see that deck in action. I, I know it's very popular. A lot of that has to do with when you have, you know, five guilds or five wedges or five shards, the one that kind of sees the least amount of play, the most maligned one, does get to have a fan base as a result of that. But there's a lot of power in this wedge. It's picked up a lot of powerful cards over the course of the three sets. And Josh's deck, it, it's interesting to see because he's taking kind of a middle approach from the extreme beat down Frostwalker builds of this deck to the Corsair carry added builds. It is an aggressive deck, but it's playing with a lot of counter spells. It has some control over the game, and now at 10-2-1, uh, might be one of the eight decks we have in our top eight.